Well, good morning and welcome to the Amarillo Evangelical Baptist Mission. It's good to have everybody here this morning. It's good to be here this morning. Uh -huh. Lord, thank you for waking us up this morning. It's good to have you all tuning in with us online. I uh, want to let you know that uh, the great part about God's Word is that it's unchanging. It doesn't change. God doesn't change His mind. He doesn't change His ideas. He doesn't change His mindset. And He certainly doesn't remove His promises. So whether you listen to this live like we are here this morning, or you listen to it 10 years from now, provided the Lord hadn't come back by then, it'll still be the same word. Amen. Mm -hmm. So it's good to have you all here with us. Uh, here in just a minute, we're going to do some song, some praise and worship music. And so in that time, if you want to, feel free to sing along with us. Amen. Or just use that as an opportunity to pray and just get kind of heart to heart with the Lord and talk and ask that the Lord prepare your heart for the message this morning. Amen. Before we do that, Brother Gary, will you open us up in prayer? Father, I just want to thank you for this wonderful rain that you gave us. Yes, thank you, Father, for what you're about to give us, Father God, because we sure desperately needed it, Father. And Father, I just ask that the Holy Spirit would just lead us and guide us this morning. And Father, just instill within each one of us a burning desire to want to follow after Jesus. And Father, I ask you to touch Kathy this morning, Father God, that she would just feel your peace and feel your strength. And feel your wisdom. Give her her wisdom, Father God, that she would know know exactly what to do in that place, Father God, because I know it can get too hectic at part at times. Now, thank you, Father, for this wonderful day in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 Praise God. <coughs>
everybody feels that way this morning, that they're a child of God. Again, we'd like to welcome you to be with us this morning. Like I said, if you're listening to the message, we don't really care where you are. If you're in your living room, you're in your bathroom, you're in your kitchen, preparing a meal, <coughs> you're outside, maybe you're in your shop, you know, working on a project, and you just happen to catch us. You know, that's what it's all about, uh, is trying to preach that word wherever you are. Mm -hmm. And so we want you to be a part of that. Um, if you won't get in trouble for that, that is. So um, if you're at work, make sure you clear that with the boss first. But yeah, we want to make sure you're with us, all right? We're going to jump into some positive social media this morning. And, and I, hope that, I hope that positive social media is something that you find, that you appreciate, and that you share. Because that matters so much. Chances are, if it did something for you, it will do something for somebody else as well. Uh, so this morning, I want to start off with... Uh, this one might actually hurt some feelings this morning, and I apologize if it does. It's not me, it's, it's God working on it. It says, McDonald's can mess your order up 101 times, and you still keep going back. One thing goes wrong at church, and you quit. People just aren't hungry enough. That's very true. That's the number one reason people leave churches. They just weren't hungry enough. There for the wrong reasons, and there are many people that you will see a lot of times that are just looking for an excuse. They're looking for the reason, and they're hoping that you'll help them find it. Find a problem with everybody, with everything. It's always them, it's never you. Uh, that's not what it's about. In that same, that same thought, though, I don't want to sell the fact that church is perfect. I'm not perfect, 
Is anybody in this room perfect this morning? No. Well, then we then we have to expect that church itself is not going to be perfect. There's going to be people that say things that might hurt feelings that might not even know they did. And that's just where it takes clear communication, conversation, sometimes even debate, if it sharpens our education in the Word. And that's what it's about. Do you want me to send you a picture of that one, Gary? Yeah. I'll send you that. The second one this morning... Um, this is something that we're all faced with the reality of. Everyone must choose one of two pains. The pain of discipline or the pain of regret. And that's, that's the life that we live. You either have the choice to follow him with your everything or to deny him with your everything and later on regret that you didn't follow him. Right? That's, that's the pains we get to choose from. Now, Choosing the Lord is your uh, choosing God as your Lord and Savior. Choosing Jesus as Lord and Savior doesn't cost you anything, but the life that you're about to open up and embark on and live through could cost you everything. And so you need to be aware of that. What are you willing to give? Because if you have limitations on your give, it's going to be a rough relationship. But if you have no limits in what you'll give, then it should be pretty easy. Thirdly, uh, y'all ever pay attention to people that crochet like calendars and stuff. They do all kinds of different signs. Um, I've seen a lot of people that do that. I saw this one. I couldn't help myself. I had to put it in there. When you are hanging on by a thread, make sure it's the hem of his garment. <laughs> well, there you go. All right. Make sure it's the hem of his garment. Because even just the faith to reach out and touch his garment <laughs> creates healing just by faith. And we saw that in the Word, right? The last one I have this morning... We need to be aware that repentance is not the work of a day, but of a whole lifetime. Because God will continue to call us to repent of different things as life goes on. It's not just going to be one thing. He's not going to say, hey, out of these ten things that you do wrong, I'm okay with these nine, but I really don't like this one. Uh -huh. He's not okay with any of the ten. Isn't it good that God's, God's mercy and God's judgment isn't like ours? And we sit there and we talk about lesser of evils and, uh, you know, who should be more guilty than somebody else of a sin that we consider to be lesser than another sin. And the truth is that sin to God is all the same. It's all unacceptable, right? And it's through Jesus that we get healing from that sin, right? We get to start anew. And then we have to make, uh, talking about the pains, right? We have to make the deliberate decision to get away from the things that are going to cause us to pitch the backslide again, right back into that place, right? And so that's part of that repentance, is that full change, that complete 180, hey, I don't want to do this anymore. I want to, I want to follow you. I want to please you. I want to live for you. And so I know that this is not that, and so I'm going to change my way. Some questions. Y'all ready for some questions this morning? Here's a good question I like to ask people. Do you have... Do you have enough faith to believe that God doesn't exist? Some people say, what do you mean? That doesn't take any faith at all. I beg to differ. I think that takes a lot of faith. If you don't believe that God exists, I think that takes faith. It takes a self-preserved faith to believe that he's not real. Uh, looking back at science, a lot of scientists that teach Big Bang Theory, they teach evolution, they teach all these things, you know that they're in a similar predicament to us. You want to know what that is? We didn't witness the creation. We were not around. God even, God even warns Job very, very sternly. Where were you when I put these things in place? Because mankind was not part of it. So we didn't witness it. Scientists believe in the Big Bang Theory. They believe that this humongous explosion happened out in the middle of nowhere, and it created all that you see now. Okay? Which to me... I'm going to tell you what, I, honestly, so the Word of God in, in Genesis 1-1 one, one says, In the beginning, God. In the beginning, God created the heavens and, and the earth. earth. Yeah. Okay? I think it takes more faith to believe that a giant explosion made this all happen. Anybody with me on that this morning? I'm more willing to believe in the beginning, God. That's right. God spoke and it happened. I believe that. Big Bang Theory, guys, I've seen things blow up, and they don't ever blow up inward. 
They don't ever create stuff. They destroy stuff. Okay? It'll take a house and throw pieces of it everywhere. Okay? But both of those ideas take faith. Get that? So some people say, well, science isn't a religion. Well, in that way, yes, it is. Because you're believing in something that you haven't seen. You're putting faith into something that you couldn't possibly know because you weren't there either way. And so the rebuttal to that from the scientist's point of view is, well, you don't know what happened that way either. And you say, you know what, I didn't see it happen. But by faith, I believe that that's exactly what happened. That's right here, yeah. Amen. Okay? And the Word of God is there to prove it. Okay? Secondly, do we know, if I was to ask you individually, if I was to say, do you know what simple faith looks like? No. A lot of people would say, well, what, what is simple faith? You know? What do you mean by that? And, and the reason I'm going to point that out is because there's some things in life that take simple faith to believe. It's simple to believe. And there's other things in life that are a lot harder to believe. They're a lot more difficult to believe. And then if we struggle to deal with easier things, how do you suppose we will deal with the more difficult things? Not well, right? It's only fair to say. If you can't deal with simple faith items, when a, when a situation or a time in your life calls for severe faith, you're not going to have it. You're not going to know where to muster that up from. Right? That's why it's imperative that we work on our reading of the Word, our belief of the Word, and our faith in the promises of God. Because they all will come to fruition. I promise that. Okay? All right, so here we go. Um, we're going to start off in Matthew 4. Verses 18 through 25. Um, and I'm not sure what happened to my slide here. But it says, um, it's going to talk about Jesus calling his very first disciples. Okay? And so, um, I didn't mean to put that on the screen just yet, but it's there. Anyways, if you don't have a Bible, please feel free to read along with me. Um, if, if you decide that you, and I'm actually going to encourage this, that you do some independent study afterwards today. Okay? Don't just say, you know, well, Kyle said, so it's got to be. Listen, Kyle said because God said. Follow me? Mm -hmm. So if God's calling you to get deeper in the Word, you need to do that. All right? Right here in uh, chapter 4, verses 18, verse 18 says, As Jesus was walking beside the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon called Peter and his brother Andrew. They were casting a net into the lake, for they were fishermen. I want to stop right there for a second. Fisherman in this case is not talking about Kyle being a fisherman. I like to fish. If I get a free chance and I have some, and I have a fishing pole and I got a boat or I've got an opportunity to get out in the water, hopefully with a license so I don't get in trouble, I like to cast a line and try to catch a fish. But I'm not a fisherman. We need to understand that in this con in this context, they were fishermen. That was their trade. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's what they did for a living. Okay? Like like firemen, okay? Firemen put out fires for a living. That's that's what they're well trained in. They're professionals at it. They know about backdrafts. They know about entries to a structure without without potentially causing somebody else danger. Okay? They realize the power it takes to hold the hose. These fishermen did this by trade. This was their bread and butter. This is how they ate. This is how they survived. <coughs> Excuse me. So it's safe to say that they were professionals in the, in the world of fishing. Okay? And that's going to be important as we go on here. Verse 19. I'm going to miss something here. Okay. Verse 19 says, Come follow me, Jesus said, and I will send you out to fish for people. At once they left their nets and followed him. Now, two huge things going on here. Come follow me. I will teach, I will send you out to fish for people. Well, what does that mean? First of all, what does that mean? What does it mean to fish for people? You think you're going to throw a worm out there on the hook and somebody's going to come along? And... I'd be good if they did. Okay. <laughs> and in kind of a way they will, but not, not, not in that context. Okay. Yeah. And then check out what happens in verse 20. This is a situation of intense, extreme faith. 
at once they left their nets and followed him. They basically said, this is my business. This is what I do for a living. But he said, follow me. So I don't care about this. I'm leaving this and I'm following him. Amen. Wow. I struggle with that. Do you know why I struggle with that? Because I don't know if I have that faith. God may have to talk to me a few times one-on-one -on -one for me to get that. Yeah. I know in other times in my life, God had to make things abundantly clear to me. Right? This would be one of those times for me. I believe that. To just, to just hear Jesus say, come follow me. And us be like, you know what? We're going to give up our profession. We're, gonna, we're, we're talking about giving up your livelihood. You're giving up your money, your income. You're giving up your professional trade to follow him. Wow, yeah, wow. Now I, wanna, I just want to point out that that's no easy task. It's not something that was done lightly, but it was something that was done freely and obediently. Amen? Wow. Okay. Verse 21. Going on from there, he saw two other brothers, James, son of Zebedee, preparing their nets. Jesus called them, and immediately they left the boat and their father and followed him. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> are you able to picture that? They're sitting there getting ready. They're about to go out on the water and get the day's harvest to try to get their income. There's a lot of competition in this market. That's why I, that's why I call them professionals because... They, they brought their fish to a market. I'm sure that's how they got paid. Mm -hmm. there's, a lot of, there's a lot of competition. So they got to get out there on the water and do this. And Jesus says, come. And they leave everything. They leave their nets. They leave their boat. They left their dad. Yeah. <laughs> and they said, bye. Peace out, dad. Catch you later. I'm talking about situations of extreme faith. <coughs> extreme faith. Verse 23 says, Jesus went through Galilee, teaching in their synagogues, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom, and healing every disease and sickness among the people. News about him spread all over Syria, and people brought to him all who were ill with various diseases, those suffering severe pain and demon-possessed, those having seizures, and the paralyzed, and he healed them. Wow. Amen. Amen. Large crowds from Galilee, the Decapolis, Jerusalem, Judea, and the region across the Jordan followed him. Now, I, I had to throw this out because I want, I want you to really get the context of this. I'm telling you, I, I can't make this up. The more that I read, the more layers of the onion God peels back for me, and I start to see things from a different point of view that I didn't before. Mm -hmm. And he only does that if you get into the Word. He doesn't do that otherwise. He's not just going to give you some kind of reverse osmosis because you're sitting next to your shelf and your Bible happens to be sitting on it. It doesn't work that way. If you think it does, good luck with that. Check, check this question out. This is God talking to me during study of the Bible. How many of you would pass on the opportunity to listen to Jesus himself preach the gospel? Could you imagine being there at church? Let's, let's call it church that day. We're in the sanctuary that day. Of course, he didn't need a sanctuary. And we don't either. That's why I hate the idea of church because people think church is the building and church is the people. It's not got anything to do with the building. That's right. We could be a traveling church and guess what? Be just, just as effective, if not more so. But if you knew Jesus was preaching and you knew Jesus was the Messiah and everybody was invited, would you make an, up, would you make an attempt to be there? Mm -hmm. Yeah. You bet your rear end, right? I promise that when he spoke... People listen intently. Well, I bet you could drop a pin in that in that area and hear it. When he spoke, he <laughs> he had so much authority to him, wow. and so much love, and so much mercy and forgiveness in his voice that people knew immediately just upon hearing his voice that he was sincere. Guys, I don't know, but I don't know about you, but this is the real deal. He's going, to the, he's going to them with the message. He's not putting out, this is where I get caught up sometimes. He wasn't putting out flyers saying, hey, this Saturday, this Saturday we're going to be out here at the Civic Center. 
and y'all should come listen. He came to where the people were. And I think there's a lot to be learned from that. If you look at John 20, verse 30, we're going to read that all the way through John 21, verses 1 through 14. Okay? Um, there's a reason I kind of... 30 is actually the last verse. Uh, I'm sorry, 31 is the last verse of uh, John 20. But I'll give you all just a second to get there. I can steal some coffee while I wait. Okay, so right there at John 20, verse 30, it says, Jesus performed many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not recorded in this book. This book, of course, being the Bible. But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. Amen. Word of God says, For all who call on the name of the Lord will be saved. The problem is, not everybody's going to call on his name. Right. Some people will call on themselves. You know what? This is my problem. I don't need him. I'm telling you we're wrong if we feel that way. Even in our best day, we still need him more than ever. Our best day. We don't always think that way, though, do we? Everything's going good. We're singing, right? <whistles> singing in the shower? Not well, maybe? I don't know. Having a great day. You need Jesus just as much on that day as you do when life feels like it's falling apart. <laughs> singing, washing dishes. There you go. <laughs> Okay, so 21.1 starts off like this. Afterward, Jesus appeared again to his disciples by the Sea of Galilee. It happened this way. Simon Peter, Thomas, also known as Didymus, Nathaniel from Cana and Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, and two other disciples were together. I'm going out to fish, Simon Peter told them, and they said, we'll go with you. So they went out and got into the boat, but that night they caught nothing. Okay, now let's let's look at this for a minute, for a second. I want you to see this from the standpoint and the point of view of a professional fisherman. You know how to fish. You do this every day. Can you imagine just for a second how frustrating it is to be out there all night as professional fishermen and not catch anything, not even catch a cold. Okay, can't even catch a cold. It's frustrating. It's somewhat embarrassing because you're supposed to be the professional in your trade. Could you imagine if Kyle rolled out there on his rowboat through a line? Bloop. Zzz, got, got a bite the first drop. Can you imagine how they <laughs> how they'd look at me? <coughs> Excuse me. They'd say, who does this guy think he is? Come out here in that little rowboat, catch a fish the first drop, right? These are the professionals. And those are the ones that you expect to see make it happen. And you can see that that night it didn't. Okay. Verse 4 says, Early in the morning, Jesus stood on the shore, but the disciples did not realize that it was Jesus. He called out to them, Friends, haven't you any fish? Now, I don't know this to be accurate, but I can only imagine a missed frustration having what appears to be a stranger on the beach Asking, had you caught anything? I'm guessing that's a little bit more frustrating. Well, I pay it. Right? They're, and, and, and look at look at this. No, they answered. What do you, what do you think that no sounded like? They shouted. Yeah, right. No! It catch anything! <laughs> They're frustrated. Been out there all night, didn't catch nothing. Verse 6 says, he said, now check this out. I want you to really picture this. Throw your net on the right side of the boat and you will find some. So we know one thing is true. Currently, the net is on the left side of the boat. Right? Simple faith. If you're throwing it on the opposite side, you're throwing it on the right side, it only insists that the net is currently on the left. Simple faith. But I want you to picture yourself as the professional being told by what looks like a visitor, who's probably a little too invested in what you're doing, saying, put your net on the other side of the boat and you'll catch some. 
What do you suppose the response on the boat is? <laughs> yeah, somebody, I, I mean, you have to think somebody was like, this idiot. Throw it on the other side of the boat. What's that going to change? If the fish are not biting, if I put the net over here, behind us, in front of us, it doesn't matter where I put it, I'm still not going to catch nothing. Would that only make sense? It would appear to. Check this out, though. When they did, which, may, might, which might actually show that it took a minute to get to that place. Right? I can see me and Weldon arguing first, right? Yeah. Look at this guy on the beach telling us he don't know nothing, whatever. We, we'd be the same guys, would we not? Okay? So they were unable to haul the net in because of the large number of fish. Wow. I love this song about that. They probably, honestly, if you think about this, they probably took the net and put it on the other side of the boat more out of frustration. Let's show this, let's show this guy that's not going to change nothing. We'll do what he, let's just try it. I mean, we've been out here all night, we had not got nothing, what's that going to hurt? Had not got nothing yet. So now they put it on the right side of the boat. And there's so many fish they can't even hold the net up. Amen, wow. Verse 7 says, Then the disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter, It is the Lord. As soon as Simon Peter heard him say, It is the Lord, he wrapped his outer garment around him, for he had taken it off and jumped into the water. Not only did he jump into the water, y'all, he jumped into the water to go be with the Lord. That's what he wanted to do. He kind of looked at his fishermen pals. He said, good luck. Y'all have a great day. I'm out of here. Jumped into water to get on the shore with the Lord. It's pretty neat if you ask me. Verse 8. The other disciples followed, uh, followed in the boat, towing the net full of fish, for they were not far from the shore, about 100 yards. When they landed, they saw a fire of burning coals, there with fish on it and some bread. Jesus said to them, Bring some of the fish you've just caught. So Simon Peter climbed back into the boat and dragged the net ashore. It was full of large fish, 153. <laughs> but even with so many, the net was not torn. Why was the net not torn? Let me tell you, because Jesus was involved, right? Mm hmm. Verse 12 says, Jesus said to them, come and have breakfast. None of the disciples dared ask him, who are you? They knew it was the Lord. Amen? Amen. Oh, wow. Jesus came, took the bread, and gave it to them, and did the same with the fish. This was now the third time Jesus appeared to his disciples after he was raised from the dead. Okay? And why so many times? Why so many times to make the appearance? It's because I'm going to say this out loud. Look, Jesus wouldn't need to show up for me. You know why? Because I'm hard-headed. Anybody else in this room hard-headed this morning? Okay. The reason Jesus showed up so many times was to prove I did exactly what I said I was going to do. And here I am as a result. He also kept continue, he continued to make it known, I'm not here for very long. Right? So I want to talk about some key takeaways from today's story. Y'all ready? Second. Excuse me. I don't know. All right. Still getting over a cold, y'all. I'm sorry. Okay, so some key takeaways I want to talk about this morning. Fishing for fish can teach us a lot about fishing for people. If you really understand... The profession of fishing. Okay? Some people are probably looking at me like, this guy's an idiot. What's he talking about? Well, I'm not saying I'm not an idiot, but I'm saying I'm going to try to bring some relevance to why I said that. Different types of fish require different fishing locations and different kinds of lures and baits. Y'all catch that? Mm -hmm. Why does that have anything to do with catching fishing for people? Because you can't catch every single person <coughs> with the same bait. Okay? Yeah, amen. Everybody's coming into a situation from a different standpoint in life. Which means that sometimes in order for you to be successful in preaching the gospel to them, you have to understand what they've been through. 
And sometimes, unfortunately, if you haven't been through something at least similar, you might not can. Right? That's why I told my youth all the time for years, there is somebody in your life that you can reach that I can't. Somebody that knows you more, that trusts you more, uh, maybe you've seen more of their life hands-on, and, and you have a way to approach them that will make more impact than anybody else could. Okay? Um, some people will simply believe. They will have simple faith. They will believe at the, at the sound of the Word of God being preached, they will believe. We see this in the Word. When Jesus preached, he had a following mm -hmm. quickly. And, and don't get me wrong, it also had a lot to do with his healing, his, his healing of, of illnesses, probably of cancers, of paralytics. Um, he, he healed the demon possessed. We see this in his word, right? So we know these things happen. People that had seizures were healed. To become a professional in the field, we may need to go out on the water with someone who has more experience than us. That's why sometimes it would be frustrating if you had the professionals out there on their vessel and I come out of that little rowboat and catch a fish the first drop. Now, I'm not saying that that won't ever happen. You might be able to share what you do know about the gospel and cause somebody else to become a believer. Could happen. But it's imperative that when we don't know the answers to questions, that we do some research and study. And sometimes the best study is with somebody that you trust that has been in the Word of God longer than you have. Amen? The Word of God says that iron sharpens iron. Mm -hmm. And the only way it's going to do that is if you break your iron out, right? Time to start talking. Sharpen that bad boy up and get it ready. Okay? We need to be able to distinguish the sound of our Master's voice and hear it above and over everything else. Amen. Okay? This is kind of like the person, in this case, that's teaching you how to fish. Okay? Um, think about how irritating it would be as a professional to have somebody stand behind you and tell you, you're doing it wrong. You're doing it wrong. You say, I've been doing this for 35 years. The voice behind you says, you're doing it wrong. Now I want you to imagine is that, that fisherman. Honestly, imagine the guy on your boat with you tells you, yeah, if you put the net on the other side of the boat, you'll catch fish. What a ridiculous statement. You would honestly think that is ridiculous. It's utter ridiculousness. If I'm not catching them here, I'm not going to catch them there. Mm -hmm. And he says, listen, you're missing out. You're missing out on a big call because you won't listen to simple instruction. You ever feel like in your walk with the Lord that you're missing out on the big deal because you won't listen to simple instruction? I feel that way sometimes. I'm like, oh, I'm so hard-headed. Break through, Lord. Speak to me. Continue to speak to me. Sometimes you got to speak a little loud because I'm a little dense. Just make it very clear that it's you. But then when you hear the master's voice, recognize it. Just like you did your parents when you were little. They said, time to come home. They yell out in the neighborhood, time to come in. He would say, who was that? You'd be like, oh, that was my mom. <laughs> that was my dad. Because you knew their voice. We need to know his voice like we know their voice. Amen. Okay? We must never think that we know so much that we can't learn anymore. Why? Because in your life, if you are not learning something every day, you might find out you're not really living. Yeah. I learn stuff all the time. And I'm going to be honest, like mercy of the courts, sometimes I learn things that I should have probably known. And you know what? That's okay. Because at least I learned it. All right? <coughs> you may be called to make adjust we may be called to make adjustments in our approach even as professionals and we must not get mad but simply trust and obey the results will speak for themselves you need to be most aware that you will never catch a fish if you never cast a line if you never cast a net or a line you'll never catch a thing okay and God calls us all to be fishers of men. Okay, so this matters to us. And I just kind of wanted to finish the story today with this picture. You can trust him. 
Imagine that. Look where the fish are not. They're not on the one side of the boat, but look where they are. They are on the other. Here's the thing. People say, well, how did God know that? Well, God designed that. That was part of his setup right there. And why do people do things that God calls them to? Out of faith. Now, this was probably... This was probably more of an argumentative faith than it was of an, of an obedient faith. It was kind of like, well, let's just throw the net over there and prove to them it's not going to work. But when they did, they received quite the surprise because it worked better than anybody could have ever told them. Right? So that's pretty amazing in and of itself. Amen? Amen. This morning, look, God desires to have a relationship with you. And you could see that... And Jesus inviting his disciples in to have breakfast with him. You get stuff like that all the time. He, he was constantly teaching them. He's constantly teaching us. Okay? And not everything is in the Word. You know why? Because it couldn't be. You're covering too many events. You're covering too many people's lives. You're covering too, much, too many things. Can you imagine how big the Bible would be if it covered everything? I don't know that this bar could hold it. That's the Bible I have, but I'm guessing the Bible is going to be 10, 20 times that size. Yes, sir. The Word also says that, that he performed so many miracles and all that. So that's a, if all the books were written, if all the miracles he ever did, the world couldn't even hold them. Oh, my goodness. Yeah. Could you imagine that? Going to a library that's about, the door's about to blow off because it's got so many books in it. For well, during three years, <laughs> he did more than what the Word talks about. Absolutely. And how, do, and how do we know that? Faith. Faith that it happened. So this morning, if you're wondering if God still loves you, if he still wants to have a relationship with you, the answer is simple. It is clear, and the answer is yes. Absolutely. But God is not going to force himself into your life. God wants to be chosen. He wants to be your first priority every day. He's not the Kool-Aid man. He's not going to kick in your door. Oh, yeah. He desires to have a relationship with you, but you have to choose him. So this morning, I'll leave you with that question. People both in the physical and in the, uh, I guess, the networking audience, will you make the choice to choose him? Think about that. Really let your heart work on that. Because honestly, I think if you're really paying attention to all the facts that are given, it takes more faith to believe that God doesn't exist than the simple faith, if you just look around for a second, that he does. Amen. Brother Weldon, would you close us in prayer this morning? Dear Heavenly Father, we just come to you this morning asking you to teach us for we know not all things <coughs> we thank you do, but you know more. Let us not question what you thought of your way of doing things. Just forgive us what we fail to do. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Yeah. Thank you and tune in again next week. See you then.